you know, there's that old saying that when you teach, you learn something twice. And that's really true because uh, I love learning from my students. And when you have to teach something over and over and over again, you learn it in such a solid way, much deeper than if you had just practiced something one way by yourself. Welcome to the Acoustic Guitar Podcast. I'm Jamie Stillway. And I'm Nick Grizzle. In this episode, we're talking about the joys of teaching guitar. We have a great panel of guests, Jane Miller, Jess Barron, Sean McGowan, and Happy Trom. Jane Miller is a professor at Berklee College of Music and has performed and given master classes around the world. Jess Barron has combined her background in music education, child development, and educational theory to create guitars in the classroom a nonprofit that trains teachers to play guitar and use music as a teaching tool. Sean McGowan is a preeminent fingerstyle jazz guitarist and a professor of music at the University of Colorado, Denver. And Happy Trom is an icon of the folk music scene who has been on the cutting edge of music instruction for more than 50 years with Homespun, starting with reel-to-reel audio all the way through streaming. And your hosts have teaching experience too. I've been teaching for more than 20 years in private lessons, virtual lessons, guitar workshops, and clinics around the country. And I taught drums and music technology in private lessons and group settings for a decade, including in public schools. We had such an enlightening and wide-ranging conversation that we can't wait for you to hear it. Nick, what stood out to you? I like that we talked about the rewarding elements of sharing knowledge with beginning guitarists and building community through our guitar playing identities. And I quite enjoyed the discussion on the pros and cons of learning one-on-one in a group and virtually. And then we got into that part about the science of brain development and, and how that relates to learning music. It's really, that was really cool. Right. And the conversation reminded us that there's always more to learn, even for the most experienced of teachers. Yeah, and, and that it's always a joy to pass along the gift of music to an eager mind. Before we get into it, I do want to thank everybody who listens and supports this show on Patreon. If you'd like to support the show, you can check us out on patreon.com slash acoustic guitar plus or check the show notes for more information. We do release bonus episodes just for the Patreon community, and there's a whole bunch of other great extras there. So check it out, patreon.com slash acoustic guitar plus. So let's just get right into it. Here's our conversation about the joys of teaching. Wasn't there an anecdote about, I think it was Pablo Casals, who in his 90s was practicing every day, and somebody said, "Um, Mr. Casals, maestro, uh, why do you still practice two or three hours a day? And he says, I'm beginning to see some improvement. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's awesome. So I did some back of the napkin math here, and we've got over 150 years of teaching experience on this panel, and I know that is a low (laughs) estimate. Yeah, I'm almost, I got almost 100 of those. (laughs) (laughs) I wanted to just jump in with a question uh, that, uh, you know, might might get our brains working down memory lane a little bit. I wanted to ask the panel, and we'll go one at a time here, do you remember the first guitar lesson you ever taught? Let's start with Jane. If, you're, if you've got it ready, what was the first guitar lesson you ever taught? Uh, what was it like for you? My first experiences teaching were really with, with uh, friends and family. I was teaching my sisters, you know, how to play a few chords when I first learned them and, and teaching some friends. Um, but I got my first teaching job at a store. And I mean, I just needed a job. So I stopped into a music store and, and um, I was asked to do you uh, teach guitar? And I said, oh, me? Sure, of course I teach guitar. You know, I was probably 18 or 19. And um, 
I just learned. I, I said yes and, and learned how to do it as I as I went along and worked with some young kids, as you do in, in those situations. And um, I had taken, taken piano lessons early on and learned note reading. So that was... That was one approach I took in teaching, uh, especially younger kids. And um, the the book that was offered through the store was uh, Alfred's basic uh, guitar book one. So it had some simple melodies and learning how to read notes. But later when I got familiar with, with different books along those lines and, and could choose some, I went with Happy Trom, Happy Trom book one. Similar thing with the uh, uh, note reading, and it was fantastic. So I, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> um Happy, let's go to you next. What uh, what was your first uh, guitar lesson you ever gave like? Yeah, I was also probably about 18 or 19. I probably had only been playing myself for two or three years at that point. Took on a job as a, as a so-called folk music counselor at a teenage camp. So I was a couple of years older than the teenagers at the camp. And uh, part of my job was to give guitar lessons to, to some of the kids that were interested and also to lead folk songs. I started a little chorus and that kind of thing. Um, and then after camp was over, I started getting calls from parents of kids. Would you continue giving my kids lessons? And right out of college, that's how I earned a living. It was a great experience because I could um, kind of learn things myself and then just pass them on. And even to this day, all these decades later, if I figure out something, a new song, let's say on the guitar, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, how can I show this to other people? And it's just kind of a natural extension of who I am, I think. You know, and I took some lessons from Brownie McGee uh, on blues guitar for two or three years. He was a big influence, too, because I saw how he taught. And uh, I didn't follow his way of teaching strictly because he was more of a let's play together and you stop me if you see something you want me to explain. Or he would criticize me. We'd be playing together and he'd say, no, you got to get your thumb more in rhythm. That's, you know, if you're not playing strong enough or whatever. So I, t I took a much more step-by-step -step approach. And uh, when I when I have taught, even now at workshops and things, I break things down in, a very, in very sizable chunks, little bites that people can pick up on. So whether it's uh, keeping an alternating bass going or showing how chords move up the neck and that kind of thing, it's very analytical and... You know, I'm not a, I don't consider myself a hugely advanced player, even after 60 some odd years of playing. So I'm just still learning myself all the time. Uh, Jess, I want to ask you the same thing. First guitar lesson you ever taught. Well, I basically got pulled into something akin to a, to a fire drill. It was an insane situation. I was 14. I'd been playing since I was seven. It was summer and I was looking at the high school I was going to be starting in the fall. There was an extension guitar class going on for older teens and adults. That was a huge group and it was the first day total beginners and I was just walking down the hall. And the person who'd been hired to teach that class knew I played guitar somehow they knew that about me I don't even remember who it was, but they took one look at me and they grabbed me by the wrist. And they yanked me into the room and they said, I need you to help me teach this class. And I was like, what? I said, what do you want me to do? And they said, walk around the room and correct everybody's posture and hand positions. So talk about the deep end of the pool. It was really cool. And, you know, that led to me becoming a group guitar instructor. I think that was probably always in the stars for me to be somebody who works in groups. And I wound up teaching the adult beginner classes at the Old Town School of Folk Music. By that point in time, I think I was 19 and I kind of knew what I was doing more. But I did a lot of private teaching and going around to kids' homes and really figuring out how they learned. And that was the juice for me was like, well, this kid learns differently. Let me figure out how to present the material in a way that they're going to get it the first time out and not be left feeling like inept. That's really been the course adjusting for people's learning styles and creating different inroads. But that first experience was definitely trial by fire. I think probably for all of us, we could say our first lesson was a happy accident. Mine was also. Sean, do you remember your first lesson and how old were you? <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's cloudy. I think, you know, informally, um, well, first I should mention that my mom was a public school teacher. So the concept of teaching was always around in the atmosphere and I guess in my blood, you could say. And um, even when I was in high school, when I had only been playing for a couple of years, 
I just found myself naturally coaching or giving lessons informally. It was just a real informal thing. People would get together and, and they would jam or it would be more formal, like I would play in the pit band of our um, high school musical theater group. And there was a constant exchange of information. And I would show other younger guitar players how to do things. And, and I, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed, um, as everybody has mentioned so far, that, that kind of reciprocity of information, but the aspect of giving, sharing knowledge and showing somebody how to do something was um, very rewarding for me. Uh, that's just a part of my personality type as well. And I think my first official, you know, um, lessons when I was getting paid was when I was 18, I started working at a store. I'm from a small town in Maine. And in those days, basically the only information that you could access, you know, was through like Guitar Player Magazine or or books, you know, method books that, you know, older method books that might be around maybe in a music store. And so I remember um, when I started teaching lessons in a store, it was really kind of all by ear, which now in hindsight, I look back and I think that that's a really good thing because a lot of it, you know, was kind of coming from rock and blues guitar and it was a lot of improvisation, a lot of uh, learning songs by ear. And I think that that's a, that's a great way to start learning and a great place to start teaching from as well. Jamie, you alluded to your story, too. I want to hear your story. I worked at the Denver Folklore Center at the time, and I had heard about a teacher who was, I think he was, I don't know if he got a different job at a different store or something, and he said, you know, we need to fill this slot for a teacher. And I thought, okay, sure, I can, I'll teach some guitar lessons. I've been playing for about seven years. And and so, yeah, I can remember my first lesson because I sat down and all of a sudden I was like, oh, no. <laughs> What do I do? And then I just think it's interesting to hear everyone's stories because everyone, you know, were late teenagers, mid-teens, and then it's like, and here we are. And who knew that it would lead to a life of teaching? And it's like everyone has in our discussion today, we've all got different avenues of how we go about teaching. And I'm wondering if maybe we can jump to the, if there is an ideal age to start guitar. So let's start with Jane again. Uh, never too old, never too old to start learning too young, I would say it's on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, young children can, can sometimes be really ready and, and other times not really ready. I mean, it takes, especially with guitars, it takes some physical ability, some physical strength, you know, hand size matters. And, um, you know, just if they're actually able to do it on that level, along with, um, you know, are they into it? Will they engaged and and either because they really want to um you just never know i think every every kid is going to um be different on that score i worked recently with a, a 10 year old and i almost didn't take on uh take her on as a student just because i hadn't worked with uh children in in so long um, but I just had a, had a hunch that it would, uh, this would be a good opportunity. And, and it was over zoom, of course. And, um, you know, 10 years old and she's right away, uh, saying things like, so would that be a first inversion triad? And I thought, okay, this one is going to be fun and challenging. And, and, and she was, I think we worked together for about a year. You know, I started playing piano when I was seven and um, I took some guitar lessons when I was uh, guitar lessons at 11. So, I mean, that all seems so young to me now, but that's that's what worked out for me. I really do think that um, with kids, you just never know. And it, you have to treat each one as an individual and see what they're ready for. Yeah, I see a lot of nodding. Um you know, Jess, you know, with guitars in the classroom, is it now guitars and ukes in the classroom? Did I read that correctly? So it, what, what do you think about starting with a uke uh, for the younger students? It's brilliant. It works beautifully. We do it about 50% of what we do in classrooms right now um, with children uh, uh, below middle school is ukulele, not just because it's so accessible, but because in the classroom setting, they're very uh, easy to store. It's hard to store 24 guitars in a first grade classroom. Um, and what I would say is I started with teaching guitar to three year olds and uh, Happy knows that because he and uh, Jane came through to do my first video with Homespun, which was the launching of the Smart Start Guitar Method a million years ago. 
and um, when my now 26 year old was six months old, but that's all open tuning. So that's, that's the way we approach it as we work starting in tarot patch on the guitar or the equivalent of tarot patch on the ukulele tuning the high string down. And we approach the instrument very differently. We approach it as a percussion instrument with strings, which is actually a phrase Ry Cooter taught me. He explained to me one day that a guitar is basically a double drum with strings on the front. And it's really important with young children because getting rhythm is the beginning of language and literacy, right? And it's also the beginning of numeracy. So we sequence the chords developmentally so that the hand acquires the ability one nano skill at a time. And we go quite slowly and pace it based on the kid's ability to spatially map that fingerboard. And that for some kids, boom, it's like what everybody else is saying. Some kids just have it and they take off. Chris Steely, I'll tell you, my um, former husband, Rick Turner, may he rest, please enjoy, uh, signed Chris to his first endorsement deal when he was six years old at Gibson. Chris, But Chris was raised in the bluegrass scene from the time he was a baby. He pulled a, a piece of wall art off the wall, which was a really trashed little instrument. And his mom told me, yeah, we didn't think it was playable, but he just insisted and he wouldn't stop throwing a tantrum till we actually got him a real instrument. So, you know, when you meet those kids, we're not talking about those kids. Those kids, I was I was like at six, I could play a whole bunch. I, I formally started at seven, but I was already playing at six. I had it. I already had like two or three chords. So you just got to, it's like what Jane is saying. You got to take it a kid at a time. But any child, as long as they have some way of accessing the instrument, whether it's laterally, whether you're using an adaptive pick like a Herco thumb pick, they can create that strumming motion because that's all large motor. And then it's just one finger creating notes. And kids can learn how to do that. Yeah, I think what everybody's bringing up so far is that there's so much diversity and um, complexity just in the aspect of teaching guitar, you know, and if you're going to do that for a living, I'm sure that all of us here have um, taught in so many different situations. And I think probably whether it's a camp or a music store or a private music school, that's where you have the most diversity in terms of age, right? You have adults and kids and children. And I think um, <clears throat> for me personally, over the years, I've taught in so many different situations and I kind of honed in after a while. I knew that I wanted to focus on higher education and teach college age students. So I'd say Jane and I right now, for example, we've we for a long time have focused in kind of a particular age demographic, maybe a particular genre or even. But I think as as teaching as a career, I think it's really important for aspiring teachers to think about these things. You know, what kinds of students do you want to work with? And sometimes, you know, early on, you don't have a choice. You just need to work. But gradually over time, you might want to make these choices of, of you know, whether it's whether you prefer one on one lessons, whether you prefer groups, classrooms, maybe it's genre specific or, you know, certain types of genres that you feel comfortable teaching with. And age is a part of that, you know, and um, and I have such, uh, you know, admiration and respect for people that can teach kids. You know, the youngest students I've worked with, uh, um, or I worked with six year olds once at a school and that was really hard. And it's a completely different approach you need to take. You know, you need to do games, maybe teach them about rhythm through games, maybe adopt some things from Kodai or Orf. Um, you know, pentatonics, open tunings, the smart start, those are all great resources, but it's a completely different thing physically when you're working with somebody that age than somebody who's, uh, um, you know, uh, grown, physically grown and can, you know. They don't sit through. still at that age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think, I think maybe at some point, if, if we were to identify a sweet spot with kids, I really uh, have worked with a lot of teenagers in the past, middle school, high school. And that's, I think of that as kind of a sweet spot spot because they're at the age when their instrument and their music becomes a big part of their identity and they have the attention span to real and drive to really want to create and write songs and work with you developing a lot of things and so I've over the years I've taught at several like um, creative youth festivals camps things like that doing jazz band or rock band or guitar and um, those are a lot of fun because the kids are so into it. Sean, I want to share something with you, which is that uh, there's a second brain development stage that happens at that age. So, you know, the myth about Robert Johnson going to the crossroads and like suddenly being this great guitar player. 
So with, with birth to six, we start them really young, they're going through rapid myelination, which is the fat cells that are growing along the neural pathways in the brain. And that enables rapid, rapid learning like absorption. But brain research was done, I don't know, a decade ago or something. They discovered that it's happening again in early, early adolescence. So when you get the kids at that age, it's almost like they're babies again, and they just absorb everything at record speed. And that's at the same time as their identity is forming. So what you hit on is it's it's all about who they are. If a teacher says to a teenager, do it this way and you must and all of that stuff, or a parent says, this is my agenda for you, teenager's not going to go for it. They're going to say, yeah, that's no. not, yeah, no, I'm going to ski. I'm, I'm going to snowboard. You can you can have guitar lessons, dad. But you're you're getting them when they're motivated and they're capable of going quick. Well, I wonder how, if for thinking about students who might contact you, say for those of us who teach private lessons who are adults. So I have a lot of adults and often I hear from them like, oh, if only I had started when I was a kid, you know, and I think there's <laughs> there's a lot to be said about learning things. I see a lot of head nodding in the Zoom room right now. Like we've all heard that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And it's like, you know, and then it's like, it's so wonderful to think of getting started on music at a young age. And then also you've got to remain positive and optimistic for those who are coming to it later in life, because there's still so much to learn, you know, at any time. I, for me, I find I, I do have some students who are always like, ah, if only I had started 30 years ago. So it's so different picking it up as an adult. I think that's a, a really great thing when people you know, they've had a guitar in their closet and they finally retired and now they want to play something. And an awful lot of the people that I teach are of that kind of demographic, I guess, which is, uh, you know, guys who have some, a lot of times they have some money or, or they have some time off on their hands and they just want to do something that gives them joy. And so I, then I feel my job isn't to make them into the greatest guitar player they could possibly be because they never will be, but just to give them the joy of accomplishment of, wow, I can now play that song and get all the way through it and not make a mistake or whatever. And, and that's, a, that's a great thing for people. I mean, I think that's, that's one, of the, uh, one of the perks of doing this is seeing the expression on people's faces when they say, oh, or... I never understood that in all these years. I never realized that the one chord and the four chord and the five chord go together, you know, whatever, you know, something really that you consider really basic. And uh, uh, it's that makes it a lot of fun. And that's one of the reasons I also like teaching is to get that aha moment, you know. I wanted to um, also touch on the, the different types of lessons. We've got, um, you know, some some of our panel here uh, does a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. Some of us are doing a lot of group lessons, and uh, I'm sure all of us are doing some sort of virtual lesson in some way these days. Um, I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on the differences between those settings, the the one-on-one, -on -one, the group, and, and the virtual. I'm a big uh, believer in guitar camps or music camps in general, but there's something about the camaraderie of people coming together in a closed environment where that's all they're all there for and feeding off each other as much as the teacher and i find i could teach two or three hours a day at something like that but the participants are playing together maybe eight or ten hours a day they're jamming they're talking to each other about their instruments or their whatever it is the songs and i think those are always very fertile grounds for people to grow and and have fun and make lifelong friends sometimes and i think it's you know i've done a lot of virtual teaching and i i think it's it's good but i don't think you get that same camaraderie or that same closeness and obviously with covid it's been a big challenge for everybody um but you know i still think if if it's possible to do those gatherings whether it's small groups, I, I've done 20 plus years at your McAlkinen's Fur Piece Ranch, uh, which in Ohio, and that's 10 people as a sold out class or other places where you get 30 people in a class. So, it, you know, it's it's a there's a big range, but I, I love the idea that people get together and they all have that one purpose of making music. It's it's a great thing. So well said. Thank you for expressing all that. It really is true. The, the in-person factor is fantastic. 
And it's been hard during the pandemic to adjust to online instruction, but it's also been a lifesaver for people. So our programs tripled uh, during the pandemic and they were already big, uh, but Guitars in the Classroom, Guitars and Ukes of the Classroom wound up kind of blowing up because music was such a lifeline and the group classes became a social connection during a time of isolation. And so I think people made the sacrifice of having to learn at distance. But what we did to remedy that happy is we just let people connect. And then also all the aha moments of leading music with the children in their classrooms, they got to share the, oh, I taught this song or my kids are getting their finger on the string. And so there was sort of a, um, the Zoom group became like everybody's weekly music therapy. But the hard part is when you're teaching that way, you cannot really see the full guitar. You can't see the full sitting position. You're not being able to step around the back and see where the thumb is. So all you can do is address things in sort of a general way and hope people are, are getting it. Yeah, these are great points. Um, you know, I, I think that there's no one way to do it. There's different learning styles, but I think um, ultimately the best of both worlds is <clears throat> video instruction that people have access to now and definitely the camp experience or a group experience or whether it's, uh, you know, summer guitar sessions at Berkeley or, or a college if you decide to go to music school. Those things can't be replicated and the community aspect of it is so important. I've taught for 10 years now at the Swannanoa Gathering in the summer. Jamie, you and I have done that together. And, and um, it's just, it's amazing. As, as Happy said, you know, they're, they're playing music eight to 10 or more hours that they're just together. And that reinforces the whole process uh, in such a, a, an acute way and, and such a comprehensive way. Um, and it's, it's similar, I think, in, in a college environment. You know, you're doing your one-on-one -on -one applied lessons, or you're teaching ensembles, and that, that just continues to grow and blossom when the students are hanging out and playing together. Um, at the same time, I think Happy was a real pioneer in this, the, the concept of video, you know, on-demand instruction. And that's something that just didn't exist for example, when I was growing up and and the fact that you can now have, you know, like all of this stuff on your laptop, you can go and repeat anything that you want uh, over and over again. You can play along with it. Um, I have I've have videos with acoustic guitar and string letter. I've got a dozen videos with a company called Truefire. And the software that's available now is incredible just in terms of your ability to play along and, and you know, go, go through things over and over again. Um, but I think many of us teachers, we were all worried maybe when when the online thing started really exploding and all of the free YouTube guitar lessons and there's a million, you know, and, and people were worried, well, is this going to replace you know, in-person brick and mortar lessons and all of that. And I don't think that it has because I, I'm guessing that we can all attest to students that have tried the, the only virtual thing or just taking guitar lessons on YouTube, for example, from anybody and, um, and then having problems and then, and really seeking out a teacher, um, to either correct things that they learned online or to just to have that in-person connection, that physical connection where somebody can look at your hands and your body posture and all of those things. My favorite context has, has been private lessons. I, I do work with groups, ensembles, labs, um, but I do uh, come back to private lessons really as my favorite. Sometimes I'm working with a small class and I'll think, oh, classes are great. You know, I mean, I definitely... Uh, kind of flip-flop on that one but but really with private instruction you can really meet the students individual needs um there might be students who aren't comfortable asking a question in a class but but in a private lesson they can kind of maybe speak more freely um and i just think there's more more growth that can happen in the, in that context um that usually tends to be my my favorite my favorite setting. Online classes are great. I mean, again, with private lessons, online classes work really well. With some classes, then you have to adjust. Like uh, I did do a reading lab uh, live at Berkeley, uh, but teaching that one online uh, was challenging, and we had to sort of adapt to. Um, you know, to that platform. 
we couldn't all play at the same time, for example, and play in time. So we just took turns being on the mic. And, uh, you know, that's a leap of faith, trusting that the people who are muted are actually playing. But, I mean, you know, really everyone stepped up. That that was a challenge that um, that I think people met. I took lessons from uh, a woman named Laura Weber on uh, on TV, on PBS. And I'm wondering, Happy, if you knew Laura Weber at all. Only by reputation. I remember her on t- on TV. She was really ahead of her time. Uh, you know, she had a show called Folk Guitar, and she would have guests on, and she taught, you know, weekly or nightly lessons, I think. It I didn't matter. I could be, you know, sitting down to dinner with my family, and I had to get up and go do the lesson. I was I was that motivated. I was just so into it, and she was great. Of course, now, you know, everyone does video lessons. Um, but when she was happening, it was uh, it, it was unique. It was wonderful. She was my first real guitar teacher, and I've and I never met her. It was pretty awesome. <laughs> you know, one just a quick thing in here: the the greatest boon to group lessons, anybody, anything more than five, six, seven, eight, ten people, the electronic tuner <laughs> is like came from heaven. Because I, <laughs> I can remember having to go around to each guitar and tune the strings for everybody, you know, so it, so it doesn't sound like total cacophony. Um, now everybody's got their little tuner on the end of their guitar, and boy, is that a godsend. <laughs> if we have a second, I want to put in one more thing about teaching. Um, it's really great to teach in a circle and not to teach face forward. Um, the magic of the circle is that people are learning from each other, each other. And there was a, there's a old flyer that goes up in faculty, uh, faculty workrooms in schools that says kids learn 63% more from each other than they do from you. So it's true in the group setting because everyone sees everyone and there's a transparency and a vulnerability and a sense of belonging in community that can build when everybody's learning together and nobody is immune from making a mistake. And so there's laughter that can take place. So that kind of critical voice just absolutely dissolves in the circle because you can't afford to judge the other guy. So you're not gonna judge yourself and nobody's gonna judge you because you're literally, you're learning together and it just, it just lifts up the whole group of the other pieces. If you're singing, it's easier for pitch training. So if you're an out of tune singer and you just, your cochlea isn't quite dialed in yet to that pitch, you can have a strong singer on each side of you and become a better singer as a result of that that circle. And the other thing it does is it breaks the myth of the expert. The inner voice a lot of times is very shaming, right? It's like, I'm not as good as, and that person knows more. And particularly for adults who tried to learn earlier, maybe they just didn't have the right time in their life or the right teacher, and maybe they played a few chords when they were 15, gave up, they walked away, now they're coming back at 45 or 55 or 65, but they're coming in with this, I might not have what it takes, but when you're in that circle, teacher can see what's going on face forward with every person in that room everybody's getting coached and that self-critical voice can go away faster, which frees people up to learn more because the anxiety is less, right? So breathing is better and the ability to absorb information is higher. So if you can break up the face forward thing and see yourself as a good learner, uh, you're going to do better. Oh, that's beautiful advice, Jess. Thank you for sharing all that. Learning from each other as much as learning from the teacher. I really think that's part of it, uh, the sharing idea. Obviously, I'm not taking away from what I do for a living, which is teach on videos. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of what I do, not everything. But I do think the in-person thing and with your peers, uh, pe- or people, very often you'll find one person is more of a advanced guitar player than some of the other people and in that kind of a community setting there's more often than not the more advanced one will take on the role of teacher when you're not teaching and be helping out his fellow guitar campers and I always find that's very encouraging to see that it happens 
invariably. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of that give and take, a lot of, um, you know, you feel like you're in a community, you feel like you're part of something. And a lot of times there's tears when they when they're leaving to go back to their real lives. You know, it's a, it's a very touching thing. Thanks for tuning in to part one of this episode about the joys of teaching guitar. Support the podcast on Patreon at patreon.com slash acoustic guitar plus to listen to part two of this episode where Happy Trom gives an impromptu mini lesson. Jess Barron reveals how long it takes for our brains to actually learn something new. And all of our panelists share their most favorite thing about teaching guitar. You can find more info about the episode and our guests in the show notes. The Acoustic Guitar Podcast is brought to you by the team at Acoustic Guitar Magazine. I'm your host, Nick Grizzle, joined for this episode by co-host Jamie Stillway. This show is produced by Tanya Gonzalez, It's directed and edited by Joey Lusterman. Executive producers are Lizzie Lusterman and Stephanie Campos Dalbroy. Our theme music was composed by Adam Perlmutter and performed for this episode by Jamie Stillway. Big thanks to Happy Trom, Jane Miller, Jess Barron, and Sean McGowan for taking part in this roundtable discussion. And a big, big thank you to our Patreon community for the continued support. We really appreciate it.